I'm Tony Pellegrino, joined by Val Douglas today, Super Val. Uh, thanks for joining us. We are very grateful that you uh, watch this show and uh, find whatever we're talking about interesting. <laughs> uh, of course, it's all things Jeeps, my favorite subject. So um, this is part of a live tech talk that we do every Tuesday and Thursday, today being Tuesday, August 17th. Yes. So um, again, thanks for joining us. Okay, today's topic, a hot one. Uh, gears and lockers. People always love gears and lockers. Um, it is not that well understood, and uh, we're, we're hoping we can uh, demystify it a little bit for you. As always, we welcome your questions and comments. Uh, make sure you include, you know, what your vehicle you have, make, model, um, any of that can help us better answer your question. All right, uh, today's featured product is our rash guards. Uh, more and more, I see people who stepped up and bought our aluminum bumpers, uh, but they forgot to get, this is a 3 thick steel edging uh, that protects the most vulnerable edge of a rocker guard, uh, a rear bumper, or a front bumper. So it's really nice, it just bolts right on, and uh, it's money well spent, I can tell you that. So um, if you haven't heard about that, you can add them on at any time. So if you already have the bumpers or if you already have damage, you can buy them and cover it up. So a uh, cool thing to check out and you can find those over on our website. All right, our friends over at Yukon Gear and Axle have provided us a lot of this information today that we're gonna be talking about. Uh, we've got a variety of their lockers here uh, with us in the studio and uh, we're gonna get right to gear ratios. Anybody notable that's on today before we... Yeah, started? Craig Colbert just jumped on. Nice. We've got Richard Russell, Donnie, Bonnie Lake's on. Sorry, Bonnie. Esther's on. Uh, we got Corey Horton. Lots of uh, people we're used to seeing. Yeah. Josh is on. Cool. Uh, Rick Very Harrington. Cool. Kayla Pfeiffer's on. <laughs> uh, Colby's on. Yeah. Awesome. Yep. Mi awesome. Michael is what on. Kelly? I don't know if Kelly's, Kelly's not on yet. What? Maddie's on. Andy yeah. McQuinn. Uh, Dennis Sargent. Jay Schmidt. Wow. VB Tom's on. Awesome. Mitch Moore is on. Mitch, I just texted you. I'll get back to you. <laughs> Andy Paquette. I like, can tell you Mitch has 538s. Yes. I know that for sure. <laughs> um, okay, so remember, if you've got questions or comments on um, what we're doing, just type them in. Val is here in the studio with me today. She's going to be reading the questions. Jamie's over for the YouTube question. Alex is behind the camera today. So we got lots of helpers. Kelly's on now. All right, Kel, Kel. about time. <laughs> okay, first off, um, we need to talk about the anatomy of a differential. So um, if you haven't seen inside of one, what you've got is your pinion gear and your ring gear. And then there's a couple of little spider gears inside here. And these would be your axle shafts going out to your wheels. So when this turns around, it turns this gear and it turns the whole assembly essentially turning and propelling your vehicle forward, okay? So a lot of what we're gonna talk about is associated with this. And if you change the number of teeth on the pinion or the ring gear, it will change the ratio of how many times that drive shaft turns before you get one rotation of the wheel. So um, are we looking good okay? I see Jamie with a funny face over there. Okay. <laughs> All right. So um, again, the pinion looks like this. It's got a couple of spots where bearings right on there. And then the yoke slips on here and is held on by a nut. That's what these splines are for. And I believe we've got a yoke. Do you see one sitting around? I uh, know. We've, we've usually got one here sitting in the studio. Yeah. But um, just trust me, that's where your drive shaft hooks on right here. The ring gear um, has, and all of these have like a spiral cut tooth on them. That's part of what makes it quiet when it rolls. And it adds extra length to the tooth, which gives it more strength. So, um, yeah. Any questions on that so far? Are we doing okay? We're doing all right. Jordan wants to know why he got left out. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, Jordan. Uh, he's on the other side. Yeah. Get back to work. Okay. <laughs> All right, so uh, you've probably heard master install kit, that, that term before. That includes a new uh, gasket for your diff cover, um, new ring gear bolts, seals, bearings, 
um, some thread locking compound, some marking compound, which we're going to show you in a second, so you can check the gear mesh, and a new pinion nut, and a brush here to apply those things. So um, that would be what's included in a master install kit. So okay. if you're attempting to do your ring and pinion by yourself, you want to get a master install kit first. You yeah. don't need to get a bearing kit and a shim kit. You want the full cool thing. thing. Yeah, what's important in here is right here. These are the shims. So the shims are what move the ring gear in and out of the pinion. And um, they're, they're housed behind these bearings, and that's what makes the whole thing work. So you get the right mesh on the gears. And we're going to talk about mesh a little bit more yeah. here in just a second. Obviously an axle, so front axle, rear axle, and then the splines on the end are what plug into one of these lockers. So an axle shaft would go right inside and it would have the female version of those splines. So that's how that works. And those come in all different sizes and everything. Here's a whole chart on lockers. If we get some locker questions, we'll come back to this. I'm going to keep moving on to gears. Let's, uh, obviously, there's a whole bunch of different types of lockers. And if we've got people that are curious on that, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, zip locker is uh, their version of the ARB, you know, air locker. Uh, the Spartan locker. And uh, here's a whole free spin kit, which is pretty cool. Uh, okay, so now we're down to determining gear ratio. Now you can see that this pinion looks a little different than the last pinion we showed you. Are you in pretty tight on that, Alex? Can they see that? So this is one off a nine inch ring gear. Um, when it has this extra bearing support here, um, that, that tells me that that's off of like a four nine inch. So um, kind of cool. And then it, it tells you, you know, based on the number of teeth, how all this calculates out. So we're going to get to a chart right here. Okay. So this is where I'm sure the questions are going to start flying. Right. Oh, here, God. Oh, I need yeah. to have muscles. These are, yeah, these are good gears. <laughs> <laughs> these are race gears right yes. here. <laughs> that's not light. Okay. There, so, that yeah, way you guys we'll, can we'll see that. that out there like that. Okay, so this, we put this chart together. This is as easy as we could make it. Um, starting, you know, where most vehicles have gears in this range. You know, even uh, Rubicon has a 411, right? And then you start stepping up 456, 488, 513, 538. These are the common ones that most people have heard of. Um, I can tell you that Yukon for the JL, the JT, and the JK makes 456, 488, 513, and 538. So they make those higher ranges so you guys can upgrade from whatever you got. So that's, that's pretty nice. Yes. Okay, any questions yet? Um, pretty quiet out there. Eh? No, we've got a couple of okay. questions. Uh, and also Yukon's on helping answer oh, some good. of them. Yeah, so, Alan yes. from Yukon, I, yep. I meant to mention that. Yep. So, so um, he couldn't be here today, but he's on there watching with you guys so he's live on questions as well yes jared norris wants to know so he's got a budget build on 40s dana 60 front with a spool and locking hubs um so this is a little bit more advanced from yes. where we're at right yes. now but he wants to know if he can make his turning radius any tighter if he gets a t-case in there so that he could unlock his hubs or lock his hubs in my experience no no not with a spool no it's, that's if it was a Detroit or, or you know, the equivalent uh, Yukon locker, um, then that would release and allow those two wheels to roll separately. But when it's all locked, now that's, for, for those of you um, that are watching, that's a very advanced setup. Yes. When, you, when you run a spool and you've got uh, locking hubs or drive plates, which means it's all locked together, um, that is, uh, you know, a purpose-built, off-road vehicle that you're trailering somewhere yeah. and uh, it's a cool setup and it's very reliable but like he's saying it's harder to steer and you know those are some of the disadvantages what what happens is when when we build a, a race vehicle with a setup like that we use the horsepower to turn right you just light up the tires and wick that thing so yep. yeah different driving style yes most people aren't comfortable with that if so. you do want a, a tighter turning radi radius you're going to need to get reed knuckles on whatever housing you're on and um, some of the racers have actually wallowed out the ears on their 
Axel Chefs, and I know Yukon's going to hate me for saying that because I am one of those people that have done that before, but I've got 50 degrees of turning uh, on the buggy. So Yeah, um, and we don't have a front axle here, no. but yeah, you can grind out a section and actually let yeah. the U-joints turn for you. Yep, so but not it, recommended. It's, it's risky, it's right? It's very you risky. you bind it up, Bink. Yes, so. and I need to preface that my buggy weighs 3,000 pounds, so it's super light. Yeah. Remember, we're always talking about saving weight, so that's one of yeah. the reasons why I'm able to get away yeah, with so it. so when she hits something, it'll just, like, bounce back. And, yeah. And instead of a big, heavy vehicle, go in there and bury and just... Yeah. So... Cool. Uh, Chuck wants to know how you can access this chart. Chuck, we're going to have it on our website. Yeah. If you jump over to so Tech this, Talk. Yeah, this would be on the Tech Talk page on our website. Jamie will put this up after this show as a PDF that you can download. And uh, basically, it's really easy. You've got the gear ratios here. You've got the tire size here. And uh, hopefully they can see that on the screen there. And then it literally tells you what your RPM would be. So um, it's, a, it's a great way to do it. And um, what I want people to understand is that my recommendation is always the green. Okay, so I want you to go a little bit deeper on the gear ratio than you think you should. What that will do is it'll mean you can use your last gear on your transmission without it constantly jumping down um, out of that gear. So um, if, you, if you look at this chart and you're, you know, uh, trying to wonder what's going on. If we have any direct questions, we can answer it, but. Yes, so um, 488 running 40 inch tires, does he need to go with a deeper gear? Yeah, that, that doesn't even register on this. So Jeff, yes, you need to go with a deeper gear, Perkins. Yeah, yeah 538 is really where you want to be. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And what, what's happening now is uh, like a JL, first gear is really deep, it's like six to one. So um, what's happening is, is you're able to get away with a lower gear ratio um, or a, a higher gear ratio, however you want to look at it. Uh, but you could run, you know, like a 411 and still run a big tire because that first gear is so low. But what happens is, is once you're on the highway, you're not running at the optimal RPM. Okay. Yep. So if you never hit the highway or you're not worried about top speed, then yeah. Mark has uh, Mark Ord Ondrick has a really good question. Okay. Uh, does gear ratio really matter with strength? It does. That, that's a great question. Okay, um, we we looked at gear sets a little earlier, and I've got this one here. So um, this is uh, a Dana seventy. Uh, that's why it's ratio. giant. That's why it's giant. So. What happens is, is this has to mesh like this, right? So what you can see is down here on the bottom, there's only three teeth in contact. And um, as the pinion gets smaller, that means there's only one tooth or less in contact, okay? So um, this is a very critical. So basically um, the ring gear size, so this is a 10 and 5 eighths diameter out of a, uh, like a Curry 70, and then you've got the, the pinion here, which is also bigger. And then because when you buy a good gear set, it's gonna come with a larger uh, bearing up here in the front, right by the pinion, and then there'll be a little bit smaller bearing back here, and then you slide on your yoke. So, um, but yes, you, you wanna, you know, for instance, you don't wanna put a, uh, say a 513 in a, Dana 30 or 35, right? It's that that's going to be tiny, 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 tiny. tiny, and it's just going to break off. I can um, tell you because I did it. Yeah, even even in a 44, a 513 is going to be yeah. like risky. Yes. So um, you really got to watch that. And I can tell you, you know, even between a 456 and a 488, there's an 11 percent uh, strength drop. Okay, so um, just gives you an idea with each step does and then he also wants to know about regular cut gears and reverse cut gears yeah that's a good question too um so a standard cut um, would also be the equivalent of a low pinion right so a low pinion and what that has to do with uh, is which side of the tooth is being driven okay so the the gears are designed to be driven on one side 
And um, so if it's a front axle, it's a high pinion and those drive on the correct side. And then when you put a high pinion in the back, it's driving technically on the wrong side, which is not as strong. The, the, the way the tooth is shaped, it's not as strong. So that's why everybody goes up in size, right? So that's why instead of running a high pinion 44, you definitely go to a 60 or a 70 in the rear, depending on what tire size you're running. Yes. So great question. Great question. Great question. All right, Dennis Sargent's got a good question as well. I have a CJ7, 37 inch tires with a Curry Rock Chalk 60s and a 5.3 LS and a 4L60. He was told to go with 456s at the time of the build, but wasn't sure if he should stay there with his transmission. Should he go deeper? Uh, I, I probably would, yeah. Yeah. Um, that, that tranny doesn't have a particularly low first gear. No. Um, so what, what's going to happen is on an automatic, you can get away with the wrong gear. Like if you're a gear or two off, you can get away with it because the torque converter is doing the work. But what happens is that generates a lot of heat. So that torque converter starts spinning and it'll do it, especially if you got a V8, you know, but um, it's generating heat. Yes. So you really got to watch that. You're better off to get the correct gear in there if you, if you can afford it. Yes. I, you know, it's obviously it's an expensive changeover. So that's why you really want to do it, get it right the first time. Yes. For sure. Yes. So um, the other things that I wanted to talk about when, when you're talking about selecting a gear ratio, and keep in mind this applies to whether you're a drag racer, um, a sand car racer, a daily driver, a crawler, um, whether you put bigger tires on, smaller tires, whether it's your Jeep, your truck, right? The, the gears are available for all this stuff. So you, that's where you really need to like look at what you're doing and choose the right gear ratio for your tire size. And our chart has all the different tire sizes on here. I just highlighted. And by the way, just because your tire says it's a 35 on the side, don't mean shit. No. It's probably not. It's probably a 34 or a 33. So you need to actually measure it. Okay. Yes. That's so, huge, guys, because some of you are going to be running 37s. And when you measure your 37 and find out that it's a 36 and a quarter, yeah. that's going to change a lot of yeah. different things. Yeah. So then you want to be looking at this 36 line yeah. and figure out where you want to be. Okay. So um, let's see what else we got here. I um, think they, our they next. Got to, they got to me before the, a reverse cut because yeah. I was working my way down there. I think we're supposed to talk about gear pattern next. So, yeah, I think that's what we've got coming. Um, oh, here, here, here we go. Opinion sizes. So you can see, you know, what, what's in your axle stock is has a lot of teeth. And then, you know, as you gear down, that teeth, like, start going away. You can see in this case, it only has seven teeth on there. So where, um, you know, the other one is probably got 20 right? yeah so that's a big difference so you really want to look at that depending on what you're after okay uh okay so here we're back to thin and thick cut gears by the way they make both right so you can see here with a thin cut gear on a 513 you're you're never going to be able to adjust the carrier over to make that work so you've got to have the thick cut gear in order to make that work so um it's under it's important to understand what you have in there and uh the guys over at yukon randy's ring and pinion um they're experts in this and they can they can help you uh figure this out so um very very helpful yes to, um, get you the right not only gear ratio but the gear set this is thick i like thick um that that ring gear has a lot more meat to it the threads going deeper on the bolts Yep. And, uh, you know, it's just more stable. So that's what I like about it. Any questions on that? No, I think we're, we're doing okay. okay. Jeff Perkins and Kayla are going back and forth on Facebook. So. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, Kayla is just going up to 40s. So yes. I'm sure she's, she's watching. Tires yep. Out. So, all right, let's see what else we got. Uh, okay, setup. So this is where we were talking about. Um, the shims that come in the master install. So you can add shims here to move the pinion into the ring gear, or you can add shims here, left and right, to move this away from the pinion gear. Now, 
This is really the black magic behind setting up gears, right? If you get this too tight, what happens is, is once the differential gets warm, it just is grinding those teeth together. It's wearing out the bearings. It's burning up your fluid. Um, you know, in high horsepower applications um, like this one, you'll actually see scorch marks on the edge of the teeth because, you know, we're driving so much torque through there at 130 miles an hour that um, that's why this gear got replaced. So um, really, this is an important part of understanding what's in there and how it works. And I, I hope I'm yeah. demystifying a little bit of this for everybody. Yes, and it's very important that you get the right shims in the right spot. So if you guys do attempt to actually do your own gears, pro tip is measure those shims as you take them out and write them down on something and put the shim next to where you wrote it down. So I always take a giant piece of cardboard, write down what the shim pack is. You're gonna need a micrometer and put that shim pack there and where it came from. So on the pinion, off of the yoke, and, um, and on the two sides where the axles go in, that'll be kind of your starting point for the new shims. Yep. So good stuff. Um, let's see what else we got here. Okay, so here, now we're starting to talk about the, the gear pattern, right? So this talks about the root or the flank, the coast side, the drive side, and the face. So just giving you some of the terminology here um, about how these gears work, and that's, that's what you're looking at on each of these teeth. This, these are the facets that are ground into this piece of metal. So it's a very technical and precise. It takes special machinery to make gears. And uh, the reason is, is because that you want them to operate efficiently and uh, quietly, okay? So the, when it comes to the gears, there's a whole set of metallurgy, you know, the, the actual metal combination or alloy, um, as they refer to it, of what's being used in the, in the material of the gear, the heat treating, and then the, the facets that are cut onto the face. So not all gears are made the same. No. There's, there's a whole bunch of different, and a set like this has actually been polished before we use them. So that um, hardens them. It, it, it not only does it harden them, but it also makes the break in process very slow. So normally when we would install a set of gears, you'd run them for about 500 miles and um, then change the oil, right? You want to inspect it, make sure everything looks good. And uh, that way, you know, if something, maybe the, the shim, you know, squished Moved. out or something, yeah. you know, I've seen weird stuff happen. So or in Tommy's case, he had the whole gear bolts yeah, come well, off the, the, yeah, the, yeah. The, the, that hold them onto the, the carrier yeah so yeah there's bolts that go through the carrier to this ring gear right so like that that's how that would sit on there we do have a question on youtube sure uh chris says hi i have a 2009 jku with a six speed uh, supercharged 3.8 v6 running 37s with 456s He's debating if he should go with a 488 or lower. Yeah, so a 37, you know, my my preference is 513. Okay, so, but um, depending on how much highway driving he's doing, a lot of guys would choose the 488, but but I really prefer that 513. That's for off-road, that's going to be a better ratio for yeah. you. Yep. You'll, you'll really appreciate that more. And Tyler Takeo over on uh, Facebook wants to know the difference between a 9 inch, a 10 inch, and 11 inch. What's a good gear size to run with 40? So we've confused him with the size that you were talking about earlier. Yeah. So Tyler, what actually uh, differentiates this is what axle you have underneath your rig. That's going to decide what size gear ring the actual circumference of the gear is yeah. and then from there you do have a couple of different options yeah, grab me that tape measure right, right there yeah yeah so because this might be a dana 60 gear so this is actually a dana 60 gear okay so um this you know uh, it's really common for everybody to talk about a four nine inch and then there's a optional 10 inch that you can go with it's like the more heavy duty version um that those references are really only for the ford um, once you start going Dana 60, Dana 70, Dana 80, 14 bolt, those are, those are all different. Even like a Sterling is like an 11.25. So it just depends on 
uh, the axle that you go with, like you're talking about, and then that determines the actual gear that goes inside there. So, and then once that, once you figure that out, then you choose the ratio you want, and then you can kind of go from there, okay? So I, I can tell you this, when you buy like a Curry axle, what they do is the, there's a bearing here that's this size, and they, they put the equal size bearing right here on the back side. Yeah. So the aftermarket axles um, put bigger stuff, bigger seals, bigger bearings, bigger everything in there uh, versus the more factory style that are really just made for, you know, a light duty truck or, you know, maybe a heavy duty truck. Right. Yeah. And VB Tom wants to know what the difference is. Like he asked how big is a Dana 44 ring gear? So this is a, <laughs> this is a 60 ring gear. Yep. The Dana 44 basically fits inside of it. So is, yeah, so it's it'll like it'll crazy. It's, small. Yeah, we'll see if we can find the, one here in the studio. We might. We I might mean, have one. Alex is going to look. So bear with us, right, guys. We're gonna go. oh, yeah. We, I know we did. Um, okay. <clears throat> so here, this is um, that gear compound we were talking about. So somebody that's setting up the gears would spin. The, the assembly once it's installed and then they would look at this to figure out where it's um, rubbing right I told yep. you how those teeth contact and uh, based on what they see here then they'll pull the pinion in or out or move the ring gear in and out and until they get so it, it requires taking these things apart several times and um, if you do a lot of these what happens is you can buy an install kit that's different. It's it's made for setting up the gears, and that has smaller bearing races, so it's easy to get it in and out. So, um, or I'll give you a tip: you can take your old bearings, get a Dremel, wall them, them out, out, and then they slip on a little better. It doesn't yep. take much. It doesn't take much to get them to slip fit, so it's no. a lot easier. So, um, but yeah, that's a another and i think i got so, some more pictures of this too yes okay, here, we here we go so um and i know um alex why don't you zoom in on this because this is really the 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 hot part of what happens right so top contact which means it's it's way out on the tip of the tooth Very so great. the pinion's got to go in deeper here it's heel contact um decreased backlash this is ideal. See how it's right in the middle of the tooth. It, not, not only this way, but this way. That's, that's, and then again, too deep, too low, right? So this is telling you where to move all of the shims. And uh, it's, it's literally that simple. Now I say simple, but you're talking about taking this thing in and out a bunch of times. Yes. And uh, it's a bear. It is. It is a bear. So um, for some people paying the extra, Five hundred or thousand dollars to have some shop do it. It could be worth all the yes. money. <laughs> yes, and to give you guys an idea, if you do attempt to install your own set of gears, you're going to need a micrometer and then another micrometer that even goes smaller, so you can measure in the I think it's the thousands down, um, just to make sure that you've got the right shims in the right spot. Because when you start getting these patterns, you need to really pay attention to where your numbers are and sit there and add up what the depth or the, the width of each of the shims are so you can figure out which way you need to move. Yep. And you've got to be patient. And yes, you're going to get frustrated. It's, it just, just happens. It yep. Or take it to a shop. Yep. So. so, and we need to also preface this that it's easier to do a nine inch install because you're a third member versus yes. doing a, a Dana install or Curry install because the the third member literally just the whole thing pulls out you unscrew the two bearing caps and everything's right there and that's that those actually have lock rings on them so yes. you can shift the thing and lock it down so that's that's one of the reasons why the nine inch became so popular is because it's so easy to uh, change the offset in the gears and it's fast it's a very it's fast. Super fast you'll see a lot of so. the race teams actually use a nine inch because yeah. it is so easy just to literally take it out some of them will have it in a five gallon bucket and then yeah. just put We're the new right one out. right back in and those come in a high and low pinion they come in a nine inch or a ten inch right there there's a whole bunch of options for that i can tell you if you're talking about anything ten inch it's 
over a thousand dollars for a ring and pinion, and the carrier is like five grand. Yeah. You're, you're talking about a lot of money. So that's that's race level stuff. Yep. James got a question. We have uh, another YouTube question, Gil Gilberto. Uh, what do you think about running five thirty eight gears with a forty four front and a sixty rear on forty inch tires, three point eight liter uh, with a red supercharger? Well, the, the rear end's gonna be fine. The front might be okay. You know, that's probably a high pinion 44. Um, you'll get away with that. That pinion's small, you know, don't, don't get me wrong. That is a small front pinion. But depending on the kind of wheeling you're doing, um, you know, if it's sand or snow or, you know, mud maybe, you, you might be okay. It's, it's when you get bound up in the rocks and, and you're, you know, that drive shaft's turning but nothing else is moving yet, that something's gotta give at some point. Yep. And you hope it's not your teeth on your ring and pinion. By the way, that's why uh, companies like RCV guarantee their axles, because they know what's gonna break is your ring and pinion. Okay, so, and I told you guys this before, you know, there's companies out there that offer, you know, all these lifetime guarantees. Well, that's great, but what happens when you're in the middle of the Rubicon or in the middle of nowhere, right? You, you still gotta get yourself out of a jam when you're out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, so. like if you would've broke on the Mojave Road, that would've been bad because there's literally nothing yeah. out there. Yeah, so then you gotta get creative, right? Now you're taking out drive shafts, trying to limp along. Yep. Um, that's, that can also cause trouble. So I've busted teeth off and then the tooth got caught and came around and it broke a hole in the case. I mean, there, there's a lot of stuff. So now what I do is I take a magnet. Right. Oh, it's right there. Do you see it? Yep. I've got this one here. So I take a magnet. You can buy these at Home Depot or, um, you know, Harbor Freight. And um, you just throw it inside there. And then if a tooth goes around, it'll pick it up and get it out of the way. So, um, yeah, real easy. Yes, yes. One more yeah. question. Uh, what would you run? In an LJ with a 5.7 Hemi, 545 RFE on 40s. That's a that's a 538. Yeah, yeah, you're gonna want a 538. Um, once you go to a 40 inch tire, it uh, doesn't matter how much. I mean, you know, Terramoto's got 640 horsepower, um, but since I'm on a 40, it's a 538. Yep, and, and I've got a 4L80. And Guy Cunningham has a, a similar question, JKU. Uh, running 513s on 40s with a Rubik crawler, uh, he's debating going to 538s or 456s. He's more concerned about highway mileage, but you're still going to hate yourself if you don't go to that 538. So this is an interesting thing that I was just talking to um, Dan while uh -huh. I was up there at Dakota Customs. Um, understanding, like the gentleman with the 5.7 Hemi, um, the, the Hemi engines have a sweet spot for RPM. And if you stay in that RPM, you're literally gonna get like three, four miles of the gallon better, okay? So you step outside that RPM because you got the wrong gear ratio and your mileage is gonna tank. tank. So um, you can do a little bit of Google research to figure out where the sweet spot is on your particular vehicle, but it is important to find where that is. Um, I can tell you that uh, in my Aftershock JL, running 40s and big axles and everything, um, I'm getting on the highway, I get like, if I'm, if I'm real careful, I'll get 15. So, um, but otherwise it'll drop 13, yeah. 14. So yeah, it just, uh, kind of is what it is. So what else we got? Um, Chuck Williams has a question about setting up gears. Is it possible to set a proper carrier bearing preload without having a case spreader? It is. It's just a bear, man. You are going to be. Uh, with a crowbar in there, yeah. freaking wrenching that thing out of there. I've done it, I've done it, um, but it's it's a lot more work yeah. for sure. Yeah. So, and then um, what happens is, what we were talking about before, is um, when you get the bearings set up, um, you're, this will rotate just slightly, and um, they call that backlash, okay? And the backlash is really important because um, you can't have the gears 
just pushed up against each other all the time because the differentials, believe it or not, I don't know if you've ever gotten under your vehicle after you've driven it on the highway, these things would be 250 degrees. So there's a, there's a bunch of growth happening yes. inside there. So you've got to allow room for all this stuff to grow and expand without just making them grind each other apart. So yeah, good question. Yep. Um, Jeremy Zamora, what gears would you recommend for 35s, a Dana 44, <laughs> and a 4.2 liter AMC? Ah, okay. So <laughs> um, you're, I would go with a 456. You could go with a 488, but I would go with a 456 because it's stronger. It's got one more tooth in contact. I like that. And uh, 456 is a great gear, great gear. Okay. That's great that he's got a 4.2. Yeah. You guys will find yeah, out we, why yeah, later. We'll find out. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> we shot a little video earlier today. Um, okay, so this, this literally just talks about the, the shape of the tooth and what we just saw, and it's all the technical terms. Uh, we don't really need to go into that. I showed everybody with the gear uh, pattern on there. And then I've got a bunch of information on lockers. Um, we haven't really talked about that. Um, and then I'm just going to flip through here and see what else we've got. Uh -huh. oh, oh, okay. Back up. Well, yeah, where, where are we at? On we time? got 25 oh, minutes. Good. Yeah. Okay. So keep the questions coming in. Yes. Um, I'm going to go back to the gear ratio chart because I think that's um, really for everybody that's watching, you know, it's, it's the mystical what ratio do I choose? And um, again, we talked about gear compound, we talked about the shape of the tooth. Yeah. And, um, so Zach Guptill's got a great question. When you order curries through Genrite, do they come needing to be assembled or is everything together? <laughs> they are assembled. So, and not only they're assembled, but they're, they're put together by literally the same guy that does all my race axles. So, because there's one guy there that does all the 70s, all the 60s, and uh, he's like the longtime guru there. So keep in mind, you know, now not only are you getting the better gear set, um, you're getting somebody that knows how to do it, that, you know, it's doing it right. You're getting a high clearance, you know, housing. And, you know, it's coming with brand new bearings, brand new gears, brand new everything. So, um, you know, versus you going to buy a set of gears for 500 bucks and then you got to pay somebody, you know, another 500 or more to put it in. Um, all of that just goes toward the axle that you bought. So um, it's, a, it's a great way to think about it for sure. For sure. Yep. What else we got? Um, James got more? Jamie's got a question. Yeah, there's a, uh, somebody didn't get their name. What's the difference between gearing for manual versus automatic transmission? What, what should be considered? <clears throat> okay, that's a great question. Um, well, what really happens is, is it's just a matter of understanding what your first gear and your overdrive, your, your fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth gear, you know, now um, is, and those ratios, right? So um, typically, um, uh, fifth gear would be an overdrive, and that's, you know, what those new gears are over and above that. So if you're, um, you know, a long time ago, some of the manual transmissions came with like a granny first. It was like an eight to one. And you'd actually take off in second. That's what my dad's truck had. And, um, you know, so you can, you can play around that, but what really happens is you gotta think about what your RPM is. So this chart represents your RPM on the highway, okay? So that's, that's an important part of, if you're not driving on the highway, who cares? But if you are, Remember, you're looking for the sweet spot for your engine to get the most fuel economy you can going down the road. Now, if the thing's lifted and it's on 40s, I got news for you. It's not aerodynamic, that thing's a brick, okay? So, you know, what you gotta do is, uh, you're gonna wanna be in the green zone, which is why I highlighted that. So. Yes, yes. Okay. So we typically talk about the 60s, 70s. Can you talk about the difference between a 10 and a half and a 10 and a quarter? Yeah, um, again, it's, it's the size of the ring gear, right? So the bigger the ring gear you have, the better off you're going to be. And then depending on the size of the ring gear also dictates the size of the pinion. Yep. So really you want the largest ring gear you can get. Um, now, keep in mind, what happens is, is you know, this 
this thing sits in a housing this way, right? So that means that the housing sticks down underneath that. So you're just getting less and less ground clearance, right? So if you're running a Sterling and it's got an 11 and a quarter gear in it, well, that has literally one inch less ground clearance than this gear does, okay? So you just gotta keep that in mind. Now, if you're running a 49 inch tire, who freaking cares, right? right? So. And those of you guys that always are asking about 14 bolts, that's why they make shave kits for them yeah. because it's hanging down so low yeah. that you're just literally grabbing rocks yeah, left and right. And that's a funny one because I call it the corn planter. It's got that ear that hangs down <laughs> yep. at the bottom. You just see it dragging through the dirt. You really do. <laughs> we actually have had friends that just paint their diff a different color so you could see every rock they hit. <laughs> so Jeff's got a question. Um, he's like, Nobody cares about my AAM nine and a quarter, 11 and a half on my truck. No. Those, yeah, those are pretty much indestructible. Yeah. Um, and, and they're, they're good popular, yes. lots of gear ratios. Yep. Um, like I said, Yukon, Brandy's Ring and Pinion, they have a wide variety. You know, they, they know every Jeep guy probably has a truck too. So um, they're, they're happy to help you out and get whatever gear ratio you need. Especially if you put bigger tires on your tow rig, you need to re-gear it. Yes. Or you're making that tranny work really hard. And you will so. blow it up eventually. Yeah. So. All right, so we've got one other question rolling back up. Um, how, what is the sweet spot on RPMs for a 3.6 and a JK? That would be a really good question. I can't uh, answer I think, that because my engine hates actually mine. actually says this. <laughs> Uh, what size tire? Uh, it doesn't say or what. They're just asking yeah. for RPM. Okay, so. I can tell you when you're looking at your gauge, it's in the green section where it says it's got good fuel economy. <laughs> um, Let's see. Because I printed out a chart to yeah. talk about that. Yes. So let's say, let's say 65 miles an hour right yeah. on the highway. Yep. The eighth gear is. Oh, just is, over 2,000 This RPM. is a JK. We don't have oh, eight gears. Well, oh, okay. So if you got six <laughs> gears, it's 3,000. Three, yep. Right yeah. around 3,000. 3,000. All right. Very cool. All right. Fabricated nine inch curries, high pinion housing, trophy truck ring gear. Oh, they're talking about what should I run <laughs> with the LS3 and a 6L80. Rick. Four or five thirty eights in he's that thing. Yeah, you're yeah. you're five thirty eight. You know, he's buddy. running nine inches, right? Yeah. So it's probably a uh, five twenty nine. Yes, probably. it's common. Yes. Like so Rick is the one that just had track and trail yes, finishes yes, his his rig. Awesome. It looks amazing. Looks awesome. If you guys haven't, Full JK yes. Elite. Yes. Yeah, beautiful. It's gorgeous. Beautiful. Can't wait to get out there and wheel with him. So. Yep. Uh, Jason Adams is talking about a couple different things. So we can move on to our next thing. Let's talk about some lockers and spools. Okay. So um, <clears throat> when it comes to lockers, what, what you want to do is choose the right locker for your application, right? So <clears throat> there's a limited slip, which is going to have a clutch pack and some springs in it. I think I got a picture of one here. If I can get over there. Come on, baby. Okay, so this is the zip locker. This is their air actuated. So <clears throat> when you do a zip locker, that is the equivalent of a spool. So once you hit the button, it locks, locks. both sides together and nothing's happening. Okay, so actually, I guess this is a good place to start. Yep. So a spool, literally you slide both axles in and they're connected 100% by metal. Okay, so um this is locked all the time you don't get any buttons on your dash no and when you hit the go pedal it goes yes now this is gonna spin tires and chirp them and if you're driving on the street it's not the greatest choice no i've actually had friends get pulled over mm -hmm. because their tires were chirping, chirping tires. and they got tickets yeah so be keep that in mind now if you've got a buggy <clears throat> A spool is a great option because, especially in the rear, because that way you can just lock and go and don't, yeah. not even worry about it. Yeah. So this is air actuated. It's what people commonly refer to as selectable or on demand. Yep. Okay. Yep. This is different than what comes in a Jeep. A Jeep's going to be an electric, electric. locker. Okay. So it's similar. It's selectable. It's like, electric locker selectable also. But you still need an air compressor but for this. You still need an air compressor. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so, so let me go back to the spool real quick. You guys, when you choose a spool, you'll see spools used a lot in drag racing. 
They use them all the time in drag racing. Um, I have seen some buggies out there that use spools, uh, but the big thing now with buggies is they want a selectable locker so they could turn it off and on, like what we just showed uh, on the zip locker, because they're all about tire pressures and sidewalls and gaining traction going yeah. up stuff. Well, and when you have a spool or you're locked, as you, if you've driven with yours off-road, it pushes. Yes. Right, so you're trying to turn and it's just going this way. So, yeah, yes. you want that selectability. Yep. And sometimes, you know, you guys have heard me talk about this before too, where you want to turn on or off your locker before you need it. And uh, the reason is, is because it takes a little bit of uh, backlash to get the thing to release and then, you know, you get the free wheeling so yep um, sometimes you even have to like put it in reverse a little bit to get everything to kind of relax yep so this is a more compact version um, this would replace the spider gears commonly referred to as a lunchbox locker um, only to be one up yeah from the uh, Lincoln locker yep but, uh, yeah this it's a simple little unit it goes inside it would fit inside the carrier and replace uh, the spider gears of your, your standard carrier. This is not what I would call a permanent solution. <clears throat> this is uh, like, I don't want to spend a ton of money before I get my real axle. Right. right? This will get you by. Um, the problem is, <clears throat> what I find with these is it gives the guy a bunch of confidence and then they start breaking axles or ringing pinions. Yes. And uh, because it's a real locker. So. Yep. And TJ, YJ guys, <clears throat> don't put one of those in your Dana 35. <laughs> no, that's bad not. choice. If you get one trip out of that, yes. maybe. maybe. <laughs> All right. So um, here's, here's that clutch pack locker that I was talking about where that's a limited slip. So as it starts to spin, it creates heat and then it starts to bite. And uh, the downside with rock crawling like that is a lot of the time you don't want to spin a tire because when that tire hooks up is when the shock load goes through and ends up breaking something. So you want to be real careful. You, you really want um, what's called a hard locker or a selectable locker for your vehicle, whether it's air, electric, whatever that is. Yeah. Um, is really what you're you're probably after. So Richard Russell, Tony just answered your question. There you go. We like See, selectable lockers. I can read your mind. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Although I can say that uh, the YJ that I own, the Valtastrophe, is Lincoln locked in the front. What we mean by that is we went in and welded the spider gears because I'm cheap. Yeah. Well, we did that on Jamie's first Samurai. Yeah. We gave it a Lincoln locker. Darren, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So if you haven't heard that term before, it came because uh, you take an old Lincoln arc welder and you just you take the diff cover off and just weld Burn everything in. together. Now he had the same trouble, you know, it had so much bite it didn't want to turn. So yeah, it's pretty funny. So all right, what other questions we got on either either side? Uh, T.J. Fulton in a dedicated trail rig, what would you run, a spool or a Detroit? So. Um, I'm a fan of the Detroit, um, and Yukon has a version of that. Um, so I like that. So that's a quarter turn of the drive shaft, forward or reverse, it locks the locker. Okay. So basically, when you let off the gas, it unlocks, it turns, spools, the tires can go like this, no problem. As soon as you get on the gas, forward or reverse, it locks, and they're driving. And it is super reliable, they're very strong. Um, the downside is, is if you live in a climate that gets icy, it's a bit sketchy. Okay, that's where a selectable is a much better choice. Yes. Um, but if you're looking for ultimate reliability, a lot of our race vehicles would run a Detroit style. But, you know, we've had both. We've yeah. had the air locker style. We've had the, the Detroit style. The e-locker. The e-lockers, yep. you know, um, from Auburn. I mean, we've just... There, there's a lot of different lockers out there, and um, sometimes what happens is, depending on the axle you have, and especially right now with like COVID and availability, you may not get a choice. You, you yeah. might call and go, I'll take whatever locker you got, because that's all there is. So especially if you have kind of a, a off-brand axle or something. Yep. So, or an odd one. Uh, Chris asked, uh, Dana 44, is it worth it to install a solid sleeve in place of the crushed sleeve? 
Ah, that's, uh, that is another popular question. So, so that so just means that, that it's got to be set up right. On the pinion, guys, yeah. if, when you get your install instructions uh, and watch some YouTube videos on how you install these, but yeah, watch your watch so what you've got. What that means is um, there's a normally there would be a crush sleeve here, so that when you torque this to the right setting, it preloads the bearings perfectly. Okay, where the bigger axles like this, you can see this is machined right into the pinion. So you literally just slide the bearing on and you hammer that nut on there to the full torque, which is probably near 200 pounds, and that's that. So, yep. Yep. And one more, uh, Justin Brown, is the stock LJ Rubicon locker worth keeping or should it be replaced? So here's the thing with the stock lockers. I've talked about this before too. Um, if you're, if you're operating a, a stock locker, you need to be very, very mindful that you turn it on, I would say 10 feet before you need it, and without the vehicle already being under stress. So what I would do is I would be moving along, even if you're a little bit on the gas, I would let off just slightly, push the locker, and then resume throttle. But you wanna do it before it's under tension. Okay, so if you're starting to climb already and you turn on the locker, well, the, the little teeth inside there are trying to engage. And what happens is, is you start knocking the edges off those and you know, it'll work for a while, but pretty soon it's just gonna strip out and you got nothing. So um, word to the wise, turn it on before you need it, turn it off while it's not under stress and that will last a long, long time. Um, also be diligent about changing your diff fluid. Um, keep fresh fluid in there. You know, it's, it's $20, $30 for a synthetic, you know, to change out your diff fluid. Um, spend a little extra money and save yourself thousands. Yes. Uh, and a lot of hassle and heartache if you break down in the middle of nowhere. So, yep. um, yeah. The other good thing to think about on a JK and the JL is they've got the electronic actuator that goes into the diff. If you're engaging that uh, locker when you're already on the obstacle, eventually that thing's gonna give out. Ask me how I know. Yeah. Cause mine's in the shop right now getting that replaced. Yeah, a lot of the time, if I'm out with um, newer four wheelers, I just tell them, when we hit the trail, turn that thing on. And uh, unless you can't steer, I don't want you to turn it off. Yeah. Okay, so um, it's just a good rule of thumb. Now, there's a whole bunch of other people that have this school of thought that I don't understand. They don't want to use the lockers at all until they're stuck. Well, that's a really bad idea because what happens is you have put the components that are engaged under a tremendous, like literally twice as much stress as they yeah. should have been. And uh, by then, you've also slid off your line and gotten yourself into a world of hurt. Yeah. And definitely not where you want to be. So look, I, I know some people think it's more challenging. It's not a good idea. You are stressing out every component in that drive line, your, your transmission, your transfer case, your drive shafts, the ring and pinion, the axle shafts, you are, you're giving that stuff a workout. Yep. Why so. spend the money if you're not gonna use it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you're not gonna yeah, use it, yeah. I don't know if you're yeah. but he's like, so why spend the money if you're not gonna use it? Like, the other thing is, when, if you're one of those guys that insists upon not using your lockers until you just absolutely have to, you're also tearing up the trail. So you're causing trail damage out there. Yeah. So that's never a good thing either. Yeah. So keep that in mind, because we want to keep as many miles as trails open. So a lot of people, you know, if you've ever seen any of the videos of me out wheeling, I make it look really smooth and easy. It's because my lockers are on, yes. right? I'm able to hit my line exactly where I want to go. And when you do it right, it looks like a paved highway. Yep. So, um, Again, you know, I'm not out there spinning tires and all over the place, you know, that's how you break stuff um, or damage stuff heavily. So um, just depends, you know, uh, different strokes for different folks. You, know, yep. you want to be that guy or gal. So the other thing to keep in mind is if you are out wheeling and you should happen to grab the lip off of your diff cover and the fluid starts to leak out, you need to Dress that because you're gonna run your diff dry and you're gonna lock everything up on the highway and then you would need a literal entire axle. Yeah, that, that differential fluid, by the way, is the only thing that cools and lubricates your, there's no extra oil anywhere. It's just a yeah. couple of quarts that are in there. So if you see a puddle, that's already you know, a quarter or half a quart already, yeah. 
right? So, um, yeah, you definitely need to be mindful of that. Even if it means, you know, getting down there and whacking it with a rock or a hammer just to get it so it slows Seals. down yep. the leak, you know, yep. you got to do something. So definitely a good idea. If it's really peeled off, you're going to have to take off the cover, you know, get yourself so a pan, good. catch yeah. the oil, fix it, then put it back on and refill it. So, um, yeah. Yep. Let's see. Corey Lone Wolf Picard just Anything jumped else on. on your side? Go for it. Jamie's got one. Um, I have a 2005 TJ on 35s with a Yukon Super 35 kit in the rear. It's great on the road and better off road. How bad is an automatic locker in the front axle? Uh, well, okay. So let's let's talk about that because we didn't. Yeah. Um, if if you want to put either a you know lunchbox style locker or a Detroit or something in your front axle and you're on a TJ YJ XJ CJ um, CJs might have it. You need locking hubs, okay? Because what basically, like I told you, the moment that drive shaft turns, it's going to lock those and it's it's going to be like yanking you all over the road. So you need to have a selectable locker in the front or, like we talked about before, a posi style unit, okay? Yep. But the, a posi in the front, you know, when you, if you're out rock crawling, you know, you're not gonna be able to climb something. It's, you're gonna have to give it a lot more gas and you're gonna be all over the place and you're just asking to break something. Yeah. So you really want a hard locker, that's called a soft locker, that you want a hard locker um, that is selectable for the front. Um, the, the gentleman that, that came in at the very beginning of the show had a spool or a hard locker um, with locking hubs. Um, so if he doesn't want that, he's got to get out and unlock the hubs and then be able to, to drive. So, um, yeah, it's different. And he probably had an atlas. Like, yeah. there's, there's a whole bunch of things that as you guys get more and more into this um, and you hear all these terms... You know, you upgrade your transfer case and that allows you to select whether I want front or rear drive. Where right now your stock transfer case, when you pull it back to four wheel drive, you're getting front and rear whether you like it or not. Okay. So um, I have, by the way, used locking hubs to unlock somebody who had a regular transfer case and we were able to get their rear end to shift over and then we relocked the hubs and got them going again. So, um, there's a lot of little tricks, tricks that, you know, depending on what kind of bind you're in, um, you can you can pull off. So, but these are great questions, and yep. I, I, it's it's awesome because this is the understanding people have to have to really make the right choice, or you know, and not just buy something off the internet or buy a used one. Or like, well, I got this thing. Or jump know, on a Facebook group and go, there. "What just happened? What do I do?" Yeah. Guys, we're here to answer your questions and. Obviously, Keith, Andrew, and Jeff have time on their hands, so please feel free to call in and ask them. <laughs> yeah, they're right still now. there. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Um, let's see, David. We're almost out of time, so if you got yep. more questions, can get them in. Since we're always talking about curry diffs, how often do you want them to change the fluid in those? So uh, minimum is once a year. I, I don't care if it's curry or any. Once a year, um, and if you do a lot of water driving. Um, I want you to do it more because I've told you guys before, when you're ripping along, this gear sets 250, 275 degrees, you hit a river crossing, it goes to 70. What happens right then is it sucks in a whole bunch of air, mostly moist air because you just went through the water. So you're going to get moisture in there and that, that deteriorates the oil. Yes. So, and when um, you crack that open, your you're, you're gonna oil's going to be, rust and yeah, and it's going to be milky white. Yeah. It's going to be gross. So yeah. just be so, prepared for that. So if you do a lot of water driving, you know, I'm, look, if you go out for the weekend and you're water driving all weekend, you change it when you get home. It's not like you drive through the water today. I got to change it so I can go drive again tomorrow. Just get through the weekend. It'll be fine. But yeah. um, again, typically you're not doing a lot of high speed, long driving. You, you should be fine to um, swap that when you get home. Yep. Gear oil is uh, tough. It's gear. tough stuff. It is. And we always recommend using Torco. Yeah. Uh, you could order it online. Yeah, it is. We've got some right there. Yep. I, run, I run that stuff to 75, 140. That's uh, not it. That one. This yeah. one. So, so. Um, we've got it on our website. You can buy it virtually any place. Uh, this is good quality gear oil, and it's all synthetic. Um, they do make some that are a mineral oil based if you're uh, really into 
selecting your own type of oil, but um, I'm all about synthetic, so, yep. Yep. Uh, differentials. Do you prefer putting RTV on them or do you want to use a lube locker? <laughs> well, um, I like RTV. Um, RTV, if, 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 so actually I want to back up. Yep. I like 100% silicone. Okay, that's a big difference from RTV. RTV is a fast, dry, soft lube, okay? I like 100% silicone, it takes overnight to dry, and I use the high temperature orange, only the orange, it's hard to find. Um, but when you do that, and you lock that cover on, silicone has a binding agent like glue, okay? So what that does is it helps uh, reinforce the entire differential because now not only do you have the bolt holding that diff cover is like glued on there and you're getting no movement and that's also what will prevent it from leaking so that's that's a great question I, I don't talk about that enough Jamie and I have just today had this orange 100% silicone conversation in fact I usually have some right here in my toolbox because I am all about that stuff Red too, right? Yep. Um, red yeah, orange. it's red. Oh, you reddish know what, orange. Alex, I bet it's right over there underneath that green spray bottle. Yeah. One of those drawers. Because I just bought some new stuff. Yep. And I got it at Napa because uh, I like having that stuff around. Paul, See anything over there? Paul Kenneth it's wants to know why we always use the 75140 versus the 7590. So um, we, we typically live in a little warmer climate and. Um, that gives you some additional protection in the warm temperatures. Uh, if you are in a cooler temperature, like if, say for instance, it's never exceeding 70 or 80 degrees outside, you can run the 90, no problem. So winter months, you guys could run that. Yeah. Summer months, Summer, or if you live up north yeah. in Michigan, the yeah. Montana. Oh, my Dodge yeah. truck wants 140. Yep. Because that baby's towing 19,600 pounds. Yeah. <laughs> um, we got someone with a 2021 JT Rubicon and wants to put 37s on it. What gear should he go with? So, okay, so that's one with the eight speed, right? So yep. he can get away with it. It's a Rubicon, so it came with four 11s. So if we go back to our chart, that's a good, good, good question. Example. Yeah. So glad that has the yep. lower first gear and the higher overdrive he can probably get away with it get back to our chart yeah. so and we're going to put these charts again up on our website under tech talk with tony yep. so make sure you guys go check it out after <clears throat> yeah if you haven't already been over there we have a whole bunch there of downloadable pdfs okay so 37 inch so here's the 411 at 24 26 so a 488 would have been like 28 so you're, you're talking 400 rpm but like 350 rpm not much not much you'll be fine yep with with that in a, in a jail yep yep i have a let's see don Carr says i have a dynatrack pro rock 44 they recommended mineral based diff oil does torco make that they do yes so um you just have to check it it's uh it's not the hpg it's uh i, I can't remember the designation but it clearly says mineral based yep and um so typically what I do is um, during that break-in cycle, I run the cheapest gear oil I can find out at the auto parts store. I just throw it in there because I know it's only going to be in here for a few. And, and we didn't talk about heat cycles. Yes. Um, but you want to heat cycle your gears. Um, you, what, what that means is you need to bring them up to temperature and keep them there for about 15 minutes and let, let them cool all the way down. And then you take them back out. I do that three times. And uh, then... Um, you can either run it a little bit more or you can just change the oil right then and then you're ready to go. So, but uh, heat cycling them is really important. So, um, and don't forget to change that oil. Yeah, that's, that's important, that's important too. So, yep. uh, a lot of the time, you know, what comes from the factory is, is like fish oil, not good stuff. And, you know, you want to get rid of that and put some better stuff in. Yep. So definitely and then remember the factory is is all about mileage so they're they're running the thinnest oil they can to get you the highest mileage we're looking for protection yep so 
want to keep your stuff in one piece. Yeah. <laughs> Just saying, guys. So for those of you that are asking questions about Torco oils, we actually did an entire segment with oh, Ernie. Good one. Yes, it was Tech great. Talk. Tech yeah. Talk with Tony and Ernie from Torco. So if you go back through either Facebook or YouTube, you could actually find that or you could search yeah. it on YouTube as yeah, well. I don't remember what episode number that is, but it's a fantastic like incredibly amazing he brought all the little jars with what it takes to mix up just one bottle of oil and uh it is fascinating so yes check it out if you haven't seen that and of course you can find all torco on our website too you just go to the search box and type in torco and it'll pop them all up yep well we are at the are end of our time? hour yeah, yeah you're over. okay yes um well thank you everybody we're always grateful for you watching i do want to met right yep, yep one more thing so Let thursday night here. thursday night and friday night this week is genrite jeep night thursday night is in michigan lowell michigan genrite dave is hosting it at uh one of the breweries up there so make sure you go and check that out and then tony and i are actually going to ohio oh, yeah. for the ohio jeep the night adams yep jason, jason and lisa adams will be up there and uh, we're looking forward to that one. If you guys are going to the Ohio one, make sure you register to win. Gift certificate from us. We're taking all kinds of swag to give up away. And Mickey Thompson is putting up a set of tires to give away. Free so, tires. Yes. Who doesn't like free tires? Right? I mean, that's so crazy. That's uh, so just at, because I'm coming back there. That's yep, awesome. yep. Royal Docks Brewery in uh, Ohio. So check that one out. All of those are on our Facebook page. We're also about ready to send out an email blast with them. And then Simi Valley's got one. Yep, yep. Uh, they're, they're all over the place. Yeah. Again, on our website under runs and events, you can see um, the different yep. uh, Jeep night locations. Yep. Car uh, Kayla's putting her first one on. Nice. So is Eric Brady. So if yep. you guys are up north. Kayla just and, got her cage in. Yep. That's awesome. And then we're going to be doing our next Tech Talk probably from Mickey Thompson yes. back in Ohio. So um, yeah, we're, we're uh, going to be flying back there and uh, we're, we're really excited to get back there and, mm -hmm. and do our next Tech Talk from back there. I'm sure the Adams will be around and we'll yep. have all kinds of fun. So all right, everybody. We're grateful for you watching. Thank you very much. Yep. And hope you enjoyed it. We will see you on Thursday.